Hello my friends, after months of fighting and a large number of losses on both sides, Russia has scored another victory in the two-year war in Ukraine. The town of Avidivka has fallen to the Russians, a situation confirmed by the Ukrainians themselves. The Ukrainian forces made a critical decision to avoid being surrounded. Let's understand this situation better. Commander of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, Oksandr Sihisky, who recently replaced Valery Zaligin, made the announcement via a Facebook post in which he said that Ukrainian troops had retreated from the town of Avdivka. This move, according to him, is to avoid encirclement and marks the biggest change on the front lines since Russian forces captured Bakhmut in May last year. Sirish, who recently took office, explained that the decision was taken to preserve the lives and health of the soldiers, stabilize the situation and move the troops to more favorable lines of defense. It's worth remembering that one of the criticisms leveled at the new commander was that he wasn't very concerned about the cost of troop losses in his operations. He emphasized the value of military life by saying that the soldiers had fulfilled their military duty with dignity. They did everything possible to destroy the best Russian military units and inflicted significant losses on the enemy in terms of personnel and equipment. The day before this announcement, the Ukrainian commander in charge of forces in the southeast of the country told him that he was not worried about the cost of troop loss in his operations. He had already mentioned that the Kiev forces had withdrawn from some positions in the city. Oksandr Tarnavsky said that new positions had been prepared and powerful fortifications continue to be prepared, taking into account all possible scenarios. Tarnavsk also mentioned that faced with an enemy advancing on the bodies of his own soldiers with a 10 to 1 advantage in terms of artillery. Under constant bombardment, this retreat is the only correct solution. Well, folks, as we approach the two-year mark of Russia's full-scale invasion, Ukrainian troops are under pressure along the front line. With depleted and exhausted ranks and a shortage of artillery ammunition recorded by the impasse of a large package, funding package from the United States. The situation doesn't come as a surprise even to Western supporters. Proof of this is the fact that U.S. President Joe Biden had already warned on Thursday that Vidivica was in danger of falling into the hands of Russian forces due to a lack of ammunition. After months of Republican opposition to the aid package in Congress, Vidivica has been heavily bombarded by the Russians in recent months, but only in the last few weeks have they managed to make significant advances with small groups of advanced troops managing to enter the city itself. The Ukrainian troops, under the command of Army Chief Alexander Sirij, made the strategic decision to withdraw from the city, which lies in the eastern part of the country. This move was to avoid a complete siege, which we've been talking about on the channel in recent videos. A total siege is a situation that nobody wants to face on the battlefield. As we commented here on the channel, General Sirius, who took command last week, after a major military reorganization, has sent reinforcements to help defend Avidvika. However, there are statements from Tarnavis that may have signaled that Kiev was already preparing for possible withdrawal, considering that the city was surrounded by three sides by Russian forces. The loss of the city almost two years after the full-scale invasion by Russia could strengthen President Volodymyr Zelensky's position in requesting urgent military aid from the West. That's the positive point, i.e. looking at the glass half full. As we know he has a fight scheduled at the Munich Security Conference, which adds a certain weight to the moment. Talking about the impact of this battle, Russia, on taking control of Avdivka, which was badly devastated by the fighting. This not only gives a total control of the area around Donetsk, a large Ukrainian city taken by proxy Russian forces in 2014, but it would also represent a significant symbolic gain for Vladimir Putin. We mustn't forget to mention the alarming humanitarian situation. Vili Barbarash, the mayor of Avdivka, reported that only 923 civilians remain in the city. Out of a pre-war population of around 32,000 people, the majority who remain are elderly people who refuse to leave their homes even in the heat of the fighting. And to add to the tension, John Kirby, the White House's national security spokesman, emphasized that the shortage of artillery ammunition is a major problem for Ukrainian forces in the field and, not to mention, as we commented in yesterday's video, the difficulty in replenishing personnel on the battlefield. A Ukrainian commander.
who by the way prefers to be called by his codename to Tusk. He said that before the strategy was to keep the enemy on their toes firing every half hour. But the game has changed. Now they're saving ammunition, firing only in defense or when they see a significant grouping of their opponent's equipment. And this shows an adaptation to current circumstances, where every decision has to be thought out to the millimeter. The seizure of Javid Vika would be the first major Russian victory since they took a multiple blow in May. The site is strategic, dominates important heights, and opens the way to vital logistical corridors. Mikhail Opadoliak, who is an advisor to President Zelensky, said in an interview that the move here is not about symbolism, it's purely strategic. Now there are people in Ukraine comparing Vitivika to Bakhmut, remembering the heavy losses in the defense of that city. Michael Kaufman, an expert from the Carnegie Endowment, was already talking about the risk of Vitivika being too politicized, ignoring the military reality on the ground and especially thinking about the losses in Bakhmut and what that could mean for Vitivika. Well, folks, it's not because we're not talking about something that it doesn't exist or isn't happening. Sometimes we can get the impression that the world is experiencing just two wars, one in Gaza and the other in Ukraine. But that's not true. Let's cross the Mediterranean and take a look at what's happening there. That's right. In Sudan, the situation is also heating up. The Sudan Armed Forces, SAF, made a significant breakthrough in Undermar, marking a turning point in the war against the paramilitary forces, Rapids' support force, which began in April last year. They managed to join up with other units in the south of the city, breaking a siege that had been in place since April. But what's new? They entered South Undermar, one of the oldest markets in the country. After receiving an upgrade with Mirage's six drones from Iran, thanks to a visit by Army Leader General Abdel Fattah al Baden to Tehran, in Ambada, which is in the northwest of the city, the situation became very tense. People were forced to evacuate their homes with only 72 hours' notice. What's more, around 100 men were arrested by the Sudanese Arab army. And the reports are that they were put through some pretty humiliating situations, stripped blindfolded and whipped before being released. A particularly tragic case is that of al -Akim. The former Ambada car mechanic, and unfortunately he died two days after this terrible experience. And it wasn't the first time he'd been arrested by the army, he'd been detained and allegedly tortured for One of the men who was arrested shared what the experience was like, he said, We were humiliated. We were told we had no sense of patriotism while we were beaten, some of us were crying one. Most of these men belonged to the Guran ethnic group, a minority in Sudan. They worked in the markets, selling and buying clothes. Like many towns in Sudan, Khartoum has ethnic and racial segregation. And then there's the situation of Sudanese women who, faced with this reality, seek refuge. A marked image shows one of them holding a sign that reads, I'm coming from Sudan with my daughters, refugees in a camp. The situation is so critical that the UN has already warned of the epic suffering in Sudan and made a appeal for $4 billion in humanitarian aid. And to make matters worse, SAF soldiers, especially new recruits, are being accused of looting the homes of the Gaurnyandam and people in the north and west. One of the victims said, They expelled us apparently just to loot our houses. I lost everything. They took all my furniture. For those who don't know, Sudan is an African country that, since its independence in 1956, has been ruled by Arab and Nubian elites the minority that comes from the tribes along the Nile in northern Sudan. In one of the recent chapters of this story, at the beginning of August, the army ordered a specific ethnic group living on the banks of the Nile in the eastern region of Andam, left their homes. When some of these people tried to return to collect their belongings, found their homes occupied by soldiers and their possessions missing. It's a pretty bleak scenario, and the situation in Khartoum, the country's capital, is just as serious. Of the 11 million inhabitants, most have fled the city because of the conflict. However, millions still remain there, especially the poorest and those coming from distant states such as Darfur and Kordofan, which are also the scene of intense fighting. The Sudanese armed forces have been accused of targeting non-Arab groups, mainly from Darfur, who lived in the town of Wadmadani, south of Khartoum, before being captured by the Rapid Support Force in December. Reports indicate that dozens have been killed and hundreds displaced.
the state's military governor, Mohamed El Badio, called on the intelligence service to arrest all those who work in the markets as vendors and beggars, accusing them of acting as spies for the RSF. Most of these traders in Sudan come from Darfur and Kordofan, regions marked by a long civil war. And speaking of civil war, the Sudanese army, which set up the RSF to fight a proxy war in Darfur, has been accused of committing genocide against the non-Arab communities in Darfur, killing more than a million people and displacing millions from their homes. As a result, the former Sudanese president, Army General Omar al-Bashir, was the first president in the office to be indicted by the International Criminal Court in Hague. RSF is also accused of ethically cleansing the main non-Arab community of the Masalit in West Darfur. During the latest wave of violence in the region, killing thousands of people and displacing hundreds of thousands, and to add to this situation already, 10,000 people have been killed in Sudan since the start of the war in a power struggle between two generals. As you can see, it's a really colorful panorama, tragic showing how ethnic conflicts and power struggles can devastate a country and its people. As an optimist, I continue to hope that humanity will be able to abandon barbarism once and for all and resolve its problems, all its disputes peacefully and for diplomacy. That's it. If this video was useful to you, please leave a comment, share it on your social networks like it. Of course, if you're not already subscribed, subscribe to the channel and activate the bell. Okay, people, a big hug from Professor Arrow Elves.